Waco in the middle of Texas used to be one of those American towns destined to be forever unremarkable. But 51 Days of Hell, 25 years ago, changed everything. It started when David Koresh, a cult leader who thought he was Jesus Christ, decided to take on the United States government. A gun battle ensued and 10 people were killed. But that fight then led to a bizarre standoff, which lasted almost two months, before Koresh and 79 of his followers were burned alive in a deliberately lit inferno. Only nine people survived. One of them was Australian Graham Craddock. Now, for the first time, he's telling what it was like inside Waco and why he still believes David Koresh will one day return to Earth as the Son of God. David, it is time to submit and surrender to the proper authority. Exit the compound now and no one will be injured. The name Waco lives in infamy. There are 95 people inside, of them 17 below the age of 10. You claim to be the prophet, you claim to be the Messiah. The time is to lead your people out now. To some, it was a showdown between the government and the individual. Bloodshed, inquisition, death, murder, killing, war. To most, it was the madness of one man, David Koresh, who believed he was the son of God, leading his followers into hellfire and death. You will overcome through my power. You are mine. Only nine people on Earth know what really happened inside Waco at the end, because only nine survived. You lived through this. Yeah. One was Australian Graham Craddock, who's never told his full story before until now. I got, nearly got myself killed. I spent 13 years in prison. Oh. You went through a lot of stuff. It's heavy. It is. At 56, Graham is a gentle, tortured man whose words come hard because of the horror he witnessed. He walks 18 kilometres every day to escape his memories. The reasons why I walk is to forget about things. Sometimes I do feel guilty that I'm, I'm still alive. Um, in some respects, I'm glad I'm alive because if I wasn't here doing this, nobody would be able to do what I can tell you. Graham grew up in suburban Melbourne, the son of strict, devout Christian parents. In 1988, he was searching for meaning in the Bible and in life when he met a self-styled preacher named David Koresh, who was visiting Australia. The prophets were all given a vision of our time, brethren. Do you understand that? A few months later, the then 31-year-old made a fateful decision to travel to the Texas town of Waco, where Koresh had established his Branch Davidian cult. David can you know, explain this Bible better than anyone that I've ever met. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord. Graham was and drawn to Waco by his leader's messiah-like appeal. Do you well, think he's the son of God? Yeah. Remarkably, to this day, despite everything, Graham has never stopped believing in Koresh. Look at all, all the religions you have today. If God spoke to everyone, we'd all be teaching and believing the same thing. But the fact is, it's obvious God doesn't talk to all of them, at the most, only one. And of all those people you believed that it was? David Koresh. The only one on the planet talking to God was David. Yes. And what God says, God is to bring to pass. That's what prophecy is. 
central to Quraysh's hold over his followers was his prophecy of a final battle with the government, during which he would be killed, just as Jesus was. Quraysh preached his death would lead to his resurrection as Christ, the second coming. What's a gun? Yes, we have guns. In the months leading up to the standoff, David started stockpiling weapons. Mm -hmm. Machine guns, grenades, what reason did he give? His explanation is that was we were going to be attacked. And he said that God had told him that we were to defend ourselves and get ready for it. They come in here with a gun and they start shooting at us, what would you do? And we're talking about high powered firearms, assault rifles, semi-automatics. It's war! These governments of this world are coming to an end. Go ahead and laugh. Go ahead and muse in your mind and see what happens to you. Dawn on February 28, 1993. Alarmed by the massive stockpile of weapons Koresh was building up, US federal agents raided the Waco compound. Knowing of the 95 people inside, nearly a third were children. February 28, 1993. This is what David had said yeah, was going to happen. This is and what David said was going to happen, and here we were. There were 77 agents actually involved in the initial raid on the compound. Those agents remember the bloodbath it became. The operation was named Operation Trojan Horse. Honestly, it felt more like a military operation. It just erupted from everywhere. It's like a hailstorm. Pop, pop, pop. It was just all over the place. I got the rifle out, I had a handgun. We just got shot at! Who do you believe fired first? I'm quite convinced the agents fired the first shots. Got like six rounds. We we're expecting to get killed at any moment. For me, it's not the fact that you die, it's how you die. Some people die quickly, some people die slowly. Um, and I just wanted to die quickly. The standoff has been going on about 45 minutes now. There are at least two injured officers, possibly more. In a gun battle that would last two hours, four federal agents were shot dead. While inside, six Branch Davidians were killed and many more wounded. We'll see one of the holes here. Including David Koresh, who was shot through the stomach and arm. Kind of painful. We thought he was going to die. It seemed like out of a dream. It wasn't really happening. Koresh believed he'd be dead by day's end and recorded an eerie message to his mother. Hello, tell Grandma, I tried. I'll see you in the skies. Bye. Koresh would live for now, but the fate of his followers was sealed. It would be surrender or death. The stalemate has now been going on for more than 30 hours. It doesn't seem at this time that cult leader David Koresh or any of his followers are ready to give up just yet. And so began a siege that would stretch on for 51 days. For Graham Craddock, there was never the thought of leaving. You were there on a spiritual mission mm -hmm. to find biblical answers. You didn't sign up for a gunfight and you could have left. Yes. Why didn't you? Because I had a religious conviction that what I was doing was right. I could have left before the shootout, I could have left during the shootout. But I just had this conviction that what we were doing was right. Um, that this was all part of God's plan. So your belief was stronger than your fear? Yes. As the FBI tried to negotiate Koresh's surrender, the world heard details of his twisted sexual hold on his followers. How did you feel about him taking other men's wives for himself? Well, the concept of, of taking more than one wife wasn't strange to me. It was 
from a biblical perspective, you had King David who had 700 wives, Solomon 1,000. Did it sit uncomfortably with you, though? Yes. Okay. Because, I, you know, I know the commandments, that you were not supposed to take someone else's wife. He didn't just take married women, he also took underage girls. Some of his wives were teenagers. One was 11 when she was first made to have sex with Koresh. Another of his wives was 13. It's statutory rape. Yeah. I was unaware of any of these ages or what these girls were. I knew some of them were teenagers, but I didn't know how young they were. I didn't consider it my business to pry into that situation. Whatever he, he, he did was according to what God had told him to do. He would take me on the back of his motorcycle and go up to the mountains. So I kind of knew that I was special. Kerry Jewell was just 11 when she became Koresh's youngest victim. Kerry's mother took her to motel rooms where Koresh was waiting. And he was laying on the bed and he said, come over here. In God's name, he raped her. I think that at a very early age, I gained the ability to almost exit my body and just not be there. A wall would just come up instantly and I would be gone. Do you accept that David Koresh was a pedophile? No. For me, accusing J David Koresh for being a pedophile is like accusing God for being a pedophile. Um, I just don't believe in trying to condemn God for, th for things. Uh, and this was God's work? It's a strange work. At night, the compound continues to be bathed with spotlights as loudspeakers blare messages. In the early days of the siege, the FBI negotiated the release of 18 children from the compound. Her name is Serenity. But Koresh kept over 20 trapped inside, mainly his own children from his many wives. Hey, you love me? Have a kiss? Thank you. Who's treated you good? David. The children had no choice. I'm not being here, held here against my will. I came and I went as I pleased, and I've decided to stay as I please. And the adults, no will, to oppose Koresh's mad desire for death and divinity. Is anyone holding you here against your will, Kathy? Only God. Only God. Only God. It's his will and his will be done. With them, Graham Craddock waited for the end. I was just hoping, though, there was a possibility of a way out, that something else was going to happen. You didn't want to die? No. Coming up, Waco's deadly day of reckoning. I'm talking to you. Somebody's going to get hurt. The final judgment for David Koresh. I heard this scream, hearing the sounds of guns being discharged. And how Graham Craddock escaped a fiery hell. He looked up to me and he was holding a grenade in his hand. He says, do you know how to use one of these? That's next on 60 Minutes.